And the reason we know it's 1910 is because the locomotive was built in that year. It's one of the uh, Pacific type engines on the Boston and Maine. And it is in its configuration as built without all the later plumbing and appliances that were hung all over these locomotives as, as time went by. And uh, this is an express train, as can be seen by the, the triple door baggage car right behind the engine. And uh, the, the cars behind it are all uh, through coaches. The train is moving right along. There's a cloud of dust behind it, so they're obviously not stopping at that little North Beverly. Very businesslike. Oh, yes. Out oh, of yeah. my way. Here oh, I yes. come. Get out of the way, indeed. <laughs> and uh, back then, the eastern route, which went through North Beverly, went as far as, as New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Imagine that. Yes. You could get on a train right here indeed. locally and travel. Go right through to St. John, uh, New Brunswick, or through to Nova Scotia, Halifax. <laughs> Absolutely. Now I believe uh, one of the tracks goes no further north than Ipswich. Right? That's correct. The, well, that's not correct. The track goes to Newburyport, but the trains only go as far as, as, far Ipswich. as Ipswich. Uh The track goes to Newburyport. They hope to get back there if we all live long enough. Uh, they're working on getting train service into Newburyport. Uh, I believe it was done away with in 1976. Yeah. And it's been this long, I think eight years, since they first started talking about going back. And we're still not back, and we're not even an inch closer to going back. Yeah. despite all the, the thousands and thousands of dollars spent on studies and surveys and sure and that sort of thing sure you know these these engines were very uh, intimidating to little kids like myself well sure recalling, yeah. That's recalling right. my childhood days of watching these things go through but you have to remember back then you only stood this high <laughs> you know you look at them today and you say yeah they're big but they're not as big as I remember them yeah. well if you want to see what it was like you have to get down about on your knees and look at them and then you remember them as you were when you were five or six years old true Absolutely. And we said this, these were in service up till about the last. Yeah, the, the last of these ran in 1956. In fact, uh, as close by as Marblehead. Okay. And uh, our next item comes to us from the Ted Day collection and also the Richard Sims uh, group. We have here a freight train and a the, the house siding, Rich? Yes, and this was right up at North Beverly Depot. There was a little freight house right across from the depot, and they had a little siding that went in there, and you can see that uh, right in the foreground. And in fact, the picture was probably taken from on top of a, uh, a boxcar yep. parked in that siding because it's up at the same level as the, as the roof of the train on the left there. I would say so. And the train is headed north going toward Newburyport, and uh, looks like it has a, a mogul-type steam engine on the head end. Mm. and uh, just day coaches. Oh. Tell us about this uh, the shelter uh, up there, Rich, uh, and the North Shore, quote, dude train. Yes, the North Shore dude. Um, <laughs> there was a shed up beyond here uh, back in the World War I era, and uh, it was big enough that it had three tracks in it and could hold eight or ten Pullman cars. Yeah. And the, the North Shore dude, or the dude train, as people called it, was a, a special... Uh, parlor car only train which ran from Boston down to Rockport on the Gloucester branch. And this was from the late 90s up through just about World War I. And it only ran in the summer. It didn't run in the winter because it only carried these, these wealthy uh, estate owners who lived up here on the so-called Gold Coast in the summertime uh -huh. and then went home to Baltimore and Philadelphia and New York and lived uh -huh. there in the winter. Uh -huh. But they didn't want to ride with the riffraff in and out of Boston. <laughs> So they chartered their own train, which is officially called the Flying Fisherman. Uh -huh. But everyone called it the Dude, or the North Shore Dude. Yeah. So in the winter, when it wasn't in service, the cars were stored in this huge shed up in North Beverly, about, uh, oh, maybe 100 yards north of the depot. And it would be in this clump of trees over here on the right. That's where it used to stand. Uh -huh. And it was probably done away with sometime in the, uh, the early 30s, or maybe even before that. Yeah. This picture here was dated to circa 1940, so, mm -hmm. you know, this could very well, the building could very well be just off to the right here. Yes. A little yep. bit. Yep. Well, the North Shore Dude Train, how about that? We'd also like a good picture of that if anyone can come up with it. Okay. That's, that sounds like a challenge. That is. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, we have here, uh, well, I guess you can describe it. I'll just say that it comes from the Ken Hay Collection, and... Uh, an airplane in distress, Rich. Yeah, or, or this is called being flipped out. <laughs> um, we have an Army biplane, which looks suspiciously like maybe a World War I Jenny, uh, upside down in a field up here somewhere off Dodge's Row uh, in the 1920s. And we really don't know what the circumstances of that are. Uh, no story came with this. 
Uh, oh, perhaps yeah. our good friend and Beverly Airport Authority, Paul Larkham, could fill us in uh, one of these days about this. Yes. But uh, in any event, it looks like uh, the pilot probably got out of this okay. The, the airplane doesn't look damaged. It looks like it just probably ground looped and flipped over. Yeah. Well, of course, we know the airport was begun, thought of as 27, 1927, and mm -hmm. actually started to come into existence in the summer of 28. That's so right. if this picture predates that time, perhaps the pilot had no place to land. And it that, could have this been a was forced landing. Shot, you know? That's right. We don't know. We really don't know. If anyone can add anything to this particular picture, please call us up and let us know. Okay. Uh, at the Society, we'd like to hear about it. Good. Very good. Now we're going to change, uh, we're going to get back onto the ground here and start a fine series of automobiles. Mm -hmm. All of our viewers who enjoy the old time automobiles I think will enjoy what's coming up now. All right. Uh, and again, uh, we might as well at this point, because we have a number of pictures here, all donated by Kenneth Hay, uh, your friend uh, by correspondence. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about Mr. Hay? And well, he's an old North Beverly person and uh, now lives out in Wisconsin. And he's been very good about sending pictures our way whenever he goes up and rousts around in his attic. And uh, you know, he'll, he'll send me a letter and, and out will come a couple of pictures. And he'll say, I thought you might like to have these. Isn't that wonderful? And apparently his family went through a whole succession of automobiles over the years. And he's got pictures of just about every one of them. Okay. So we're indebted to him for that. And we're also uh, going to blame him if, if somebody picks up the wrong year on some of these cars. Because quite frankly... Uh, I couldn't tell you one from another when they get back this far. Yeah. So what he says is, is whatever type of car, if it isn't, don't blame us because that's what he told us. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, what do we have here now in item eight? Well, he claims this is a 1913 Studebaker, and it certainly looks old enough to be that far back, uh, taken at the farm where they lived at 77 Conant Street, and that would be up at the, uh, the foot of Cherry Hill mm -hmm. uh, on Conant Street. And the view, he says, looks southeast and was taken about 1917. So uh, the car is about uh, four years old here and, and as we look at it. And uh, it's the typical open uh, touring car with the, the usual tires, spare tires clamped on the outside running board. Uh, you didn't go anywhere without your spare tires uh, in those days. Yep. And they will light them up lamps on the front. They were some sort of either a settling or some type of gas uh, lamps on the front. And, and they look a little unusual. They have sort of little perforated uh, discs on the front there. And I'm not quite sure what that's all about. But uh, in any event, yes, there's some sort of gas headlights. Yeah. I would imagine when these first automobiles came onto the scene back in the early 1900s, even predating this 1913 photograph here, a lot of people must have really wondered, is it all going to be worthwhile to trade in the horse and wagon for this kind of a contraption? That's right. <laughs> That's right, because they had no track record. Uh, <laughs> they were notoriously undependable. I mean, you know, you might start out and never come back, you know, or you'd end up having it towed back with a horse. Yeah. Uh, plus, they weren't cheap either. I mean, they, they sound cheap now to us. As we look back, they were, you know, three or $400 for the, the less expensive ones and up to $1,000 for the more expensive. Yep. And we say, oh, you know, boy, I'd buy a car if it was that cheap. But, you know, back then, uh, you know, maybe you were lucky if you made $1,000 in sure. a year. Absolutely. Big so money. It's all relative. Big money. We notice a number plate on the front end of it now. Mm -hmm. uh, that would have meant it had, would, have, would have had to have been registered, do you think? In that, that year, sure. In that mm -hmm. year. Yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Again, number nine, a Ford Model T. Yes. The, the typical Ford T, uh, Henry's dream car for the masses. Uh, this particular version of it was taken in 1919, and of course, Model T Fords uh, were produced from, from the early aughts, uh, right up until the coming of the Model A, uh -huh. which was, what, 1928, I believe, or uh -huh. 29. So they had a, a long run of these, these Model Ts, and of course, the early ones had a lot of gleaming brass and were very fancy and, and that sort of thing, and then the, the later ones were more mundane and, and just everything was black. Yeah. And this, is, uh, this is somewhere in between. Yeah. You know, these, uh, I'm sure, were sturdy for their day, but it looks to me like if you all got into the car at once, it just might collapse right in the middle. <laughs> well, sure, and, and if you've ever seen one of these run, the whole car is always doing this. You know, the fenders are going up and down, and, you yeah. know, everything is vibrating. Yeah. That's why they were called flivvers. Uh, true. That's mm. true, yeah. Uh, we don't hear that it's uh, Dana P. Hay in the background going into the garage here. Would that have been uh, uh, Mr. Kenneth Hay's father? I suspect that's correct, oh, well, yeah. yeah. He's never said as much, but I suspect that's true. Okay. Moving right along. Ah, uh, yes. A 1919 Overland Club sedan. 
And this was taken uh, in 1927 at, again, another Hay family homestead, uh, 680 Cabot Street, which would be opposite the North Beverly uh, Cemetery. And uh, this is a little sportier uh, automobile than we've seen so far. And it's even got a little side curtain here to, to keep the dust out when you were whipping along at, uh, you know, 40 or 50 miles an hour down some of these, these macadam roads. Yeah. That's the term, dusting a road. In That's the old right. Days. That's right. In fact, in the real old days, you actually wore a duster, and yep. the ladies had the hats with the thing tied around to keep them from blowing off, and right. you had goggles, and yep. early cars didn't even have windshields. You just, yep. you were right out there and exposed to the elements. Yep. Exciting times. Yeah. Well, this car, we can see now the transition. We're getting to see the cars look at this point in time. This is 1919, mm -hmm. or, yeah, 1919. Yeah, about 1920, we'll say. They're beginning to take <coughs> the form and shape of, of uh, the early cars. That's right. It's, it's getting yeah. out of the Model T yeah. look yep. and becoming a little more um, classy. Yep. I guess that's a good word for that. Yep. A 1922 uh, Ford Model T, Rich. Yes, and again, we just talked about Model Ts going through a metamorphosis in the years that they were built, and this is uh, a 1922 version of the type, and this is pretty pretty dull stuff. Uh, you know, there's no fancy brass headlights and brass radiator and all that sort of thing. It's just your basic black, ordinary, utilitarian sedan. Uh -huh. Square, boxy, but cheap and relatively dependable for, for the year. Yeah. And uh, this one uh, was taken in 1928, so it's already six years old. And again, this was opposite North Beverly Cemetery. You can see the cemetery behind it there in the background. Yeah. Were these the days before front bumpers, or did they just not put one on? Front bumpers were optional, okay. if you can believe such a thing. Although you, they might as well be now, because they don't do you any good today. <laughs> True. Uh, but anyway, the, the big steel bumpers that we knew of cars in the 30s and 40s were at that point an option and you had to pay extra to get one, yeah. either front or back. Looking out that window seems to be a challenge. If the sun was just in the right direction, all you might see is glass That's right. right back at That's you. That's right, and this was not, we should remind everybody, this was not safety plate glass mm. back in those days. This was regular glass which, you know, would shatter on, on impact. Yep. That didn't come along until a few years later. Here we are now, we're up to item 12, about halfway through our collection of pictures here, uh, and we have a 1922 uh, Liberty Touring Car. That's right, and uh, this again was taken in the, the Hay backyard or front yard up at 680 Cabot Street opposite the cemetery. And I think in the background there you can see the, uh, the whippet that we looked at a few minutes ago, and uh, now we're looking at this Liberty Touring Car and I'm not sure what uh, Liberty was as far as, as a manufacturer. I'm not familiar with that name. Maybe some of these old car club people can let us know. Um, whether it merged and became something else or just petered out, I don't know. But uh, certainly a big old classic uh, touring car of the 20s. Uh -huh. Say one thing, if these cars all belong to the Hay family, they must have turned them in for new models about every two years or something. Apparently they like their automobiles. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. Fine, fine pictures though. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Now, here's one of my favorites right here, Rich, as we come up to item 13, a 1926 Essex. Uh-huh. And uh, Essex, my father had an Essex, I might throw in. Um, I think his was a 1928, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, like this one, it had uh, the big wooden spoke wheels and uh, was really square and boxy. And, uh, you know, your typical uh, sedan of the 20s. I mean, it looks like it's right out of the Untouchables. Yeah. That's right, right out of Elliott Ness. Mm -hmm. Expect to see somebody with a machine gun <laughs> stick his head out the window. <laughs> uh, you mentioned an interesting story to me about how the, the companies changed from name to name here over the mm -hmm. years. Um, I think what happened, and I may have this incorrect, if somebody can tell us uh, differently, we'd be happy to hear about it, but I believe that Essex uh, and Hudson merged, and uh, the Essex, once it got into the Hudson uh, camp, uh, became the Hudson Terraplane. Uh, there's a great word, terraplane. Uh -huh. Literally a plane that travels on the ground. You know, this this yeah. idea of speed. And they had the, the rounded fenders and the, the swept back hood, you know, the aerodynamic look sure. of, of, the, of the day with the teardrop headlights. Sure. You yeah. know, a yeah. total opposite of what we're looking at here. Yeah. And of course, Hudson later uh, merged with Nash and became American Motors. Yeah. And we say uh, wooden spokes we're looking at here. That's right. These are wooden spoke wheels, and uh, that was that was common in cars right up into the 1930 period. Mm. I, you know, can't imagine how you kept them, uh, you know, from getting warped or 
Yeah, broken you know, or whatever. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. And this comes from the collection of Marjorie Martin White Up. White Up or Wood Up, and, and again, uh, we dealt with this in one of the other programs. I'm not sure because I never actually spoke with the lady in person. I only uh, corresponded with her uh, by mail. Yeah. So I'm not sure how that's pronounced, but uh, I would say Wood Up. I'll, I'll go out on a limb. Okay. And we thank her for we do indeed. fine pictures. Mm -hmm. Now, this picture before has appeared in times past in one of the uh, 1929 or 30 programs, I believe. Mm -hmm. This is our Whippet sedan, Rich. Yes. Yes, and this is, again, uh, a big four-door, well, probably six-passenger uh, sedan, as opposed to the open touring cars of the period. And uh, this, again, has the, the big wooden spoke wheels and the big round headlights and, and uh, you know, just looks like what we think of, of as gangster cars from the <laughs> 20s, you know. <laughs> um, an interesting feature of a lot of these cars is that they had suicide doors. And by that we mean that the back door, instead of opening uh, with the hinge in the front, it was hinged at the rear. <laughs> so if you opened the one on the street side to get out and you weren't careful and weren't looking to see if anything was coming and you had just started to alight from the car and a car came by and hit that door and it would crush you between the door and the car frame. Boy. Whereas if it was hinged the way doors are today, it would simply rip the door off and you might hurt your arm or sure. something, but it would, it would basically do no more damage than that. Sure. So that's why these were called suicide doors. Yeah. I love that bumper on the front end. Yes, that is, is either one of these bumpers that you could